Good afternoon and welcome to another live stream here on DreamBank's Facebook page. My name is Andy Frisky. I'm a dream curator here at DreamBank and I'd like to welcome everyone who's tuning in this afternoon. Really excited to introduce our featured speaker today. Before I go ahead and do that, I'd like to explain a little bit about what DreamBank is and why we exist. So DreamBank is a free community resource that is located in the heart of Madison, Wisconsin, and we are put on by American Family Insurance. The whole reason why we exist is to help inspire people to pursue their dreams. And in large part, it's done through the programs that we put on. So when we're not at a, under a pandemic uh, or working from home, we host right around 43 events a month in our space with eight different event series. So uh, this one happens to fall into our career series. But we also have uh, small business and entrepreneurial workshops, inspiration and motivational wellness speaker series. We have family events in our space, uh, fitness-related activities, uh, just to name a few. So we done a really good job transitioning to the virtual space and have been putting out just right around the same amount of events um, on our Facebook page here. So if you happen to like the event that you are tuning in today or curious about some of our other offerings, please go ahead and scroll through um, our past events. We've been putting out uh, right around at least one event a, uh, a day since about the middle of March. Um, we got a, a really cool event that just wrapped up our Dream Summit. So this is our second annual Dream Summit. You can still go ahead and register for that, which is on our um, our website, which is amphine.com forward slash making a difference. Um, and then we have a really, really uh, uh, cool event coming up in which the current CEO of American Family Insurance, Jack Salisweedle, and the uh, previous um, CEO of Disney, Bob Iger, will be uh, sitting down and uh, kind of having a fireside chat. Uh, that's coming up later in this month. So please go ahead and check out the website for those events. Um, but I'm, let me go ahead and introduce our featured speaker today, uh, Nikki Ryberg. So Nikki uh, is a local career coach and professional resume writer that helps clients figure out what they want to do and how to brand themselves best for it. She's a certified professional resume writer and a global career development facilitator with a master's in human resource and labor relations with over 15 years of hiring experience. A practical minimalist in her approach. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Nikki. Thanks, Andy. I appreciate all of you so much for being here. I won't lie, I really, really love doing these in person. So I'm going to try my best today to keep it as hands-on as we can. But at the same point, leave time for questions. And Andy has suggested that we do all of those at the end. So I definitely want all of you to take notes, jot down any questions you have, and just know my goal is to really time to do so. All of the things we'll be discussing today, um, you have access to all of them after this as well. So feel free to reach out to Andy or myself if you need access to any of these templates. Typically, we'd have some paper copies um, on hand to do these in person. Um, so a little bit about me. Andy did a great job of explaining it. I had a about a 15 plus year career in HR leadership before I left that career path to start my own business. I didn't do that strategically. I just knew that HR wasn't really for me any longer and I wasn't sure what I would do next. But through a series of friends and family asking me for help on their resumes and one thing leading to another, I started the small business and it's been about three years now and it's going really, really well. Um, sadly, the current state of the economy and some of the COVID related challenges have actually been good for my business, um, even though I really feel for my clients. And I am also the author of Resume Cheat Sheet and Cover Letter Cheat Sheet. Those are available for free on Amazon's Kindle app. And we're actually going to talk about those in today's materials as well. And if you want access to those afterwards for free, just let myself or Andy know. As he mentioned, I'm a career and professional branding coach. I actually work with clients all over the U.S. I have two free courses on my website. One is how to write a resume in two weeks that really breaks down the process if you want small, manageable goals. But I tell people if you want to crank it out in a weekend, that works pretty easily too. And then I also have another one I launched about a year ago called First um, Find Your Own Path. And that's to help people kind of figure out if they know they're not happy now, but they don't know where they want to go, which we'll talk about that a little bit today. It gives you some really good exercises and kind of just tips and tricks for how to navigate that process as much as you can on your own. And so today I really wanna talk about what your dream job is. 
And that really can look different for all of us. My dream job for me is doing what I'm doing right now. But I always tell people my definition of success is to do this three days a week. So I get another two days a week with my kids around my house, just kind of catching up on normal life stuff, which is especially interesting for those of us that have kids um, doing virtual learning right now. And so what my dream job is, is very different from any of the rest of you participating today. So I want to think about what your dream job is and then talk about what your strengths and opportunities are regarding that. So I'm going to actually bring up quickly, um, I have a resume builder worksheet and this whole guide is available for free later, but I wanna bring that up and kind of really dig into some of the questions on that in terms of what does your dream job look like? So I'm gonna go back up to the beginning in my guidebook. And I think one of the first things it asks is what type of position are you seeking? Now here's, if you take one thing away from today's session, it really is important for you to figure out what your dream job is. You can't apply or brand yourself very well if you don't know what you're going after. So things to think about, are there certain position titles? Are there industries you're really interested in? What pay range do you need? Are you dying to work remotely and that's your number one goal? Are you missing the office environment and wanting to get back at one in person and just hating working from home? I mean, everyone's situation is different. And quite frankly, it's going to change for you as your life goes on. Whether you're looking for one thing today, that could totally change in a year or three years from now. So I just want you guys to really think about what that looks like for you. So I just want to give you um, a little minute to think about that. And then I'm going to go back to my presentation here. And so some things are, if you don't know what that is, I think I mentioned earlier, I have my free course on my website. That can really help you. Things to take into account, maybe your personality, what your salary expectations are, location, how flexible does it need to be, and what are your own ambitions? Are you hoping to hit a certain level by a certain time in your life? Are you looking to scale back and you're kind of ready to ease into retirement? I want you to really think about what does that look like for you? And if you're still getting really hung up on that part, we would need to talk about why, what's really going on, what's holding you back, because that, as we get into this process later today, once you start the actual search, you need to know what you're searching for. So we'll talk about that a little more. And then as you start to do those, I want to give you a minute or two just on a piece of paper to think about what your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats are. Um, let's say, for example, you know you want to go into accounting, but you don't have a CPA degree. Well, be a CPA. However, identifying the interest could lead to maybe you look for jobs that are kind of in the accounting field, but don't require a CPA. Maybe you could work as a coordinator. Maybe you could start in an entry level position. Um, however, that helps us identify what your weaknesses are, but also your strengths. You've identified an interest. Maybe you have a friend that works as one. Maybe you have a network contact you can reach out to. So I want you to think through what some of those areas look like for you and jot those down, but also how you feel about them. I always find that a lot of people really learn a lot from their gut feelings. When I first started my business, I actually offered both HR consulting and career coaching. And I just kept finding myself gravitating towards the career coaching and the resume writing aspect of things because I had left HR for a reason and it truly wasn't my passion anymore. I just felt like from a business standpoint, oh, maybe I wanna offer both. And so I share that personal story because my gut instinct was there all along. I just wasn't listening to it. So in your case, if you keep finding yourself getting this funny feeling, but you can't quite identify it, I really want you to dig a little deeper there and think about what's going on. Because a lot of times you don't realize it until you look back in hindsight, but your gut feelings are telling you something for a reason. And so then what can you do about it? Maybe one of your areas of weakness is confidence, but what can you do to improve that? Or if one of the areas that you're really strong at is that you have like a family friend that's a VP of the company you wanna work at, well, how can you take advantage of that? So I want you to really think about when it comes to your dream job search today, 
what do some of those action items look like? Because those will be helpful as we start to talk through how to brand yourself, how to do your resume, and really how to go about a strategic and tactical job search in a positive way. And if you have some threats, those are good things to talk about. If there's things holding you back, if there's certain areas you don't have enough experience in, there's sometimes some really easy and free ways to make your resume stand out and still make it be a possibility for you. So what are the challenges? A lot of you may be here today because there may be a certain challenge that's just getting the best of you. So what is the absolute biggest hurdle you're facing and what's holding you back? What's stopping you? And we don't have access to the chat feature right now, but as we mentioned at the end of this presentation, we're going to have time for questions and answers. I just want to give everyone a little bit to feel free to share what's holding them back or what areas you're concerned with. Some people are really scared of the resume part. Some people just aren't sure how to interview. Some don't even know where to begin. I think if we can share those and Andy can help moderate those comments so we can kind of address those later, that would be really helpful. But as you're going through today's presentation, maybe something will trigger some interest for you or trigger an idea based on something you see here. So I want you to keep that in mind as well. So the first part, let's just pretend we know what your dream job is. Let's just say that right now, all of you know, this is exactly what I want to do. I'm just not sure how to get it. If we're still struggling with, I don't know what it is. I think I mentioned earlier, you really need to spend some time and some due diligence there figuring that out because everything that you do to really make this job search be successful comes back to what do you want to do? Um, and I say that because you're essentially selling and branding yourself. And so you can't do that if you're not sure what you're after. But let's say um, and assume for the rest of this presentation, we know what you want to do. Now we need to get organized and figure out what you need to do in order to start this process. So some ideas would be asking HR for previous job descriptions. Do you have copies of your performance reviews? I love to weave in performance review quotes into branding materials. I think it's a really fun way to make you stand out on paper. Have you asked for a lot of testimonials on LinkedIn? I love, love, love getting those. And I think you can also weave those into your materials. And I just cannot emphasize enough having numbers, metrics, and proof of your past accomplishments. And it's also a really good idea to start checking in with your references and find out who's willing to be a positive reference for you. That's also a good way to do some passive networking. They may know of some people that have openings in your dream job. So I want to bring up my job search checklist next because there's a lot of cool tips and tricks on there that I want you each to think of and to feel free to incorporate. So I'm going to go back down to it's kind of towards the end of this packet. So to start with, a lot of people just jump in and they just start applying and they haven't really thought through everything. And what I've typically found from working with clients is the ones that have the more smooth process tend to be organized up front. And sometimes this comes naturally to people and sometimes it doesn't. Also, if you were to be working with a professional resume writer, they would be asking for a lot of these details. And frankly, whether you have a resume or not, if you're just looking to make it stronger, all of these details would be really helpful. So I find it it's really good to just start there. Um, I mentioned the job descriptions and performance reviews and getting numbers. I think it's also really good if you know you need to show proof of education or a license or anything like that. Now is the time to go back. If you let something, um, let's say go, let's say you didn't keep up a certification and maybe you need to go back and just pay to get that reinstated. Now is the time to really get those ducks in a row so that you can put them on your resume. It's also a great idea to have a professional email address. This typically is for people more closer to right out of high school, college. Sometimes they haven't quite gotten that um, far yet, or perhaps you have one that's been used more for family purposes. It really is good to have your own professional personal email address. Make sure your voicemail and mailbox settings are activated. I can't tell you how many times working in HR, people didn't have that activated. And when it came down to scheduling interviews, or waiting to hear back from people. Sometimes I wonder, do I have the wrong phone number? What's going on? I 
frankly, would just move on to other candidates that were easier to get a hold of or had some of those professional courtesies already taken um, advantage of. So I would definitely recommend all of you do that. Start thinking about your list of references. Here's a really cool tip that I like to tell people is you start doing your resume and cover letter they should look and feel the same. Ideally, they have the same header at the top. I love to tell people to do that with their references as well. And your references all have the same header, all have the same type of font, the same colors used, and things like that. It really, really makes you stand out. So now's a great time to get that information in order. And that way, if something moves fast in this process, you're not going back trying to track it down. It can be very difficult to get a hold of people right now. A lot of folks have a lot of different things going on. So don't expect that your reference will just automatically get back to you when you need it. You really want to give them the common courtesy to get back to you and provide their most up-to-date email or phone number. Oftentimes, people move companies, their phone numbers may change. So now's the time to do some of that tracking down of data. And so I tell people, keep this in a folder and you can add to it as you grow in your career. So the next time you're looking for your next dream job or you're up for that promotional opportunity, if you have all of this on hand, it makes it so, so much easier. So many times I go through this and people tell me, gosh, I wish I had just kept all of this sooner. It would have been a lot faster. So I just can't recommend that enough. And so all of this will start leading to what we actually have to include in some of our materials. So for now, just think more high level. How do I start to get organized? Think through some things that maybe you know about. Maybe you did a side project for a friend. Maybe you did some pro bono work for those of you who may have had some time off of work for some time. Think about some of your volunteer organizations, just the things you've done to be involved in the community or with other people that can really vouch for your talents and skill sets. This is the time to really start collecting that information. And so next, we need to start with the most important part. What are your goals? And that involves research and that involves really um, doing some work on your end so you're prepared when you get into the interview situation. So we're gonna go back to my job search checklist. And this is where we start talking about your goals. It's good now to know what your ideal jobs look like, what types of companies, are they big, are they small? And you can look on like Glassdoor or LinkedIn and look at their reviews, talk to other people working there and think through what your top three scenarios look like. And then once you have that, it's really, really key that you think about the salary range, the schedule and the requirements you need. Um, Salary.com and Glassdoor and Indeed are all good for that. There's also the U.S. government maintains a website, which is right down here. That one's really good for some basic salary data. And one of the reasons I bring all of this up is if let's say, for instance, you know you need health insurance, it's really key that you don't waste your time applying to jobs that don't offer it. Or if you know, for instance, you want part time and that's truly what you want and you can make that work in your budget, don't apply to the full time ones. You just want to think through what that looks like for you and to really make sure you've done your research. And for anyone looking to really grow significantly in your career, do you know what the market value looks like elsewhere? Let's say, for example, you're looking to do a major pivot. Well, you may have to take a pay cut. It's important that you do the homework on your end to find out what the market value looks like for that salary. And one of the tips I tell people, a very common question I get asked is, well, gosh, what do I do when they ask me? All of the negotiation experts um, will tell you to try not to give them a number because then you're negotiating against yourself. However, recruiters and employers typically don't want to waste their time with a candidate that's just completely out of the you know, ballpark for what they can afford. So what I suggest to people is to give kind of a vague answer of, well, you know, based on the research I've done, it looks like the market value for this position may be between 35 and 45,000 a year. Is that something within your range? Put it back on them, see what they say, and then you can just say, you know, based on my experience, 
I think that that's within my range. Um, you can also give much, much more vague answers such as, you know, what really gets into the benefit package? What are the stock options? What do the bonuses look like? Are they subjective? Are they defined? Um, things like that. And kind of ask them for a little more information and just say, you know, what would your general range be? I can tell you if I'm within that. And that's another good way to do that. Um, doing full on salary negotiations and tactics is certainly a time for a whole different seminar. And there's lots of other resources out there that are much, much stronger at it. So I would just recommend now is the time to kind of start figuring some of that out and looking towards resources in your field. I worked with female engineers that would ask around to other engineering firms to get some comparison data to make sure they knew what the market values were both from females and males. So again, you just want to be prepared to have those conversations. There's a lot of great podcasts out there that get more into the negotiation piece and they'll walk through with you exactly step by step how to handle that question. However, it's just really key to know that as you are going about your dream job search, don't sell yourself short for what you qualify for or deserve, but also be realistic of what the market looks like. And so I think it's really important to start to have a roadmap for what it's going to look like to land this dream job. There's so much involved in terms of your branding materials, networking, communication style. And so one thing I want to share um, is my smartest job search action plan. And all of you are welcome to contact me after this call or ask Andy for a copy of this. I put this down um, just kind of playing off of the SMART goals, which you see all over. And because I've had a lot of clients go through things and there's certain things that trip all of us up. For some people, it's the cover letter. They just, they don't know how to write one. They have a really hard time selling themselves. So that's part of the search. So kind of backing up, listing what your dream job is, what are the non-negotiable requirements? Let's say it's health insurance. Let's say it's a certain salary level. I really like to have people focus on this when they start their search because it's so, so easy later to get desperate if you're unhappy at your current job or maybe you don't have a job right now. It's very easy to get desperate and to find yourself in a situation that later you're regretting. And sometimes that happens and you just fix it or give your two weeks notice and move on. And that's okay, we all have to take care of ourselves and that's important. However, some of the stress and anxiety can be avoided. So if there's certain just non-negotiables or things that you really, really want in your next manager or your next opportunity, I think it's good to remind yourself of that so that you don't forget about those later in the process. So we start at the top with what those are. And then this side goes through everything involved. So there's just so much going into the job search that you need to think about. So I'm just going to give you a few minutes as I kind of scan, um, skim below here so you guys can take a look at these. And the reason I like doing it in this format is I like to see goals written down. I like people to list them. I like them to think about every single aspect of the job search. Some of these won't apply to you. Some, your goal could just be not applicable. It's just really important to consider them in advance so that as you go through it, it will go a lot more um, convenient and will be more successful. And how is your version of success measured? So whether that's you know making it through an interview without getting super nervous, maybe it's getting the interview, it's just whatever that looks like for you, you need to measure your definition of success, describe your action plan, and is it realistic? A lot of folks may have this dream job and they talk about it and they talk about it for years and years, but it's like, a you know, it's eight years down the line. Let's talk through what does it look like now? What are the baby steps now to get there? And if it's completely unrealistic, how do we dial that back to make it work for you in a way that's still getting you towards your goal? Or if you're out here kind of spinning on things that are unrealistic, it's important to kind of get you back and talk about, okay, let's talk about where the opportunities are, what does the market look like? Um, all of that just varies based on what your dream job is. And what is your time frame? Some people are expect too much overnight and they think all of this will happen in three weeks. And for some it can, for many it may not. So really putting an accurate time frame. I have a lot of folks reaching out to me panicked on their resumes and they want it yesterday, but yet they drag their feet for five weeks to get me their items. And that's because they're busy. So you just wanna be really um, cognizant of what that looks like for you. 
And then how will you manage your expectations? Um, at what point will you make adjustments? At what point will you say, okay, maybe that goal was unrealistic? Or at what point do you tell yourself, no, this is the only thing that matters to me right now. I need to find a job. So X, Y, and Z hobbies need to go for the moment until I achieve that. Have you scheduled the time to do it? I'm a big person on scheduling, especially if clients are having a hard time with time management. Sometimes for other people, they find that this is too stifling. So it just kind of depends on what's working for you. And then have you done it to the best of your ability? The thoroughly part to me is really key. Have you really, really tried your best? If you're applying to a lot of jobs, well, what's a lot? Is that one a day? Did you do two all month? Um, did you do your resume, but did you really go back through it and make sure it didn't have typos? So those are all good things to think about. Um, kind of some fun things. There are websites out there. Job test prep is one of them. You can actually prepare for some of these assessments that companies require you to take. I don't have a lot of personal experience with it, but I've had quite a few clients that were finding they just weren't making it through the assessment piece, whether they were overthinking it, whether they were just not answering in the way that the positions needed, but they went through this, through this website, and they actually had a lot more success with interview requests after it. So I like to point that out. I like to point out the market value. This is why I really recommend doing that research in the beginning. If you wait until you're too far on the process, you may get an offer and maybe it sounds great to you. And then a week later you realize you completely got underpaid because you didn't do your homework to begin with. Um, now is also the time to think about your personal branding and your appearance. Do you have things to wear to an interview? If you, everything's done on Zoom right now in the beginning, have you tested it out? Do you have a laptop? Do you have internet that's working? Do you have a quiet place to go? Those are really good things to think through. And then this goes all the way through keeping your options open. Again, sometimes multiple offers come through. Sometimes you start something and it's not the right thing. It's really important to think through what that's going to look like for you and how to keep those options open. So with that, we'll go back to our slide here. And so I think that's just a really great tactical way to keep everything straight. So I highly recommend you guys use that. And then make sure you get help if you don't know how to do something or you're unsure on it. And so next, what is your brand? I always tell clients to start with Googling themselves. If there are inappropriate pictures out there, get them taken down. If you have social media, I strongly suggest locking your personal items. It's very, very common for employers to Google you. So you want to see what's out there. On the flip side, let's say you're going for like a vice president level role and you really want to set yourself apart. I should see some positive things on Google regarding your industry. Um, for instance, if you Google my name, now you'll start to see um, some things pop up that are attached to my name, speaking events I've done, et cetera. Employers will be looking for that at certain levels of their organization. And so that's key to do as well. Let's say you want to get into the HR field and you want to be a VP of HR. It would be very common to see your name attached to some HR articles, being involved in SHRM, um, professional groups and things like that. So just think about you yourself are essentially a brand as you're going through the job search process. So your brand needs to look positive and starting on Google is the first way to do that. And so think through what are your favorite brands? Like for example, McDonald's knows how to market to their customer. Another good one I think about is the UW Badgers. Everywhere you go, if you ever run into anyone wearing a Badger shirt, it's typically a, oh, hey, you know, go Badgers. Um, their marketing is all about fun and it's tied to camaraderie and the sense of community. So if you go anywhere in the world and see a Badger shirt or hat, it can bring a smile to your face. Target with the red bullseye. These are um, examples of you know, huge institutions, huge companies. But I want you to just think through what does your brand look like? And when people think about you from a professional standpoint, what do your materials look like? You know, how does your appearance come forward? And just kind of what is your overall demeanor in that process? And how can you best market yourself so that every single interaction you have with that potential employer for your dream job is really spot on? And I mentioned that earlier with having your 
resume, cover letter, and references all look the same. Just think how much stronger that looks than a candidate where all three are different or they don't even have references and a cover letter. They just have like a, you know, scribbled down resume. So that's a really good way to stand out. And so what, can, and what I tell people is start looking around, see what captures your interest. As you see other leaders or if, as you're out there researching companies and networking, what do people do that captures your interest or that you're impressed by? And then now is the time where if you do nothing else from today's presentation, which is first figuring out what you want to do, the second is if you've never invested in sales training before, whether it's reading a book, listening to a podcast, just doing some general article searches on Google, you need to start researching sales training. So much of the job search process is about selling yourself. You're selling yourself on your resume, on your LinkedIn profile. Next, you need to sell yourself in the interview process. Then you need to sell yourself in terms of experience range that you're deserving of and even your first few weeks on the job you're still really continuing to sell yourself are you everything you said you would be and so it's, for some people that comes more naturally maybe they have a sales background maybe they've gone through a lot of sales training maybe you have none a lot of people don't and there's some really really good tips and tricks that you can learn through just some basic sales training so i would check out the dream bank for instance and just see what other access you can get um, in terms of sales and that will really pay off for your dream job search and then networking you need to start doing it you need to start learning about it we're going to talk about that in a little bit so i'll kind of leave it there and so the resume this is one of my most favorite aspects of the job search process because it's a way that in anywhere from one to four pages, depending on your background and the positions you're applying to, you get to market you. You have full control over it. You can be creative in it. Um, there's just so many different things you can do here. And so I love resumes. A lot of people don't, and that's okay too, but there are so many ways to make it stand out. So I wanna go back to my job search guide and talk about the PAR approach and just talk about some easy ways to really stand out on paper. So when we go back up to the top of this guide, um, I give some prompts for like listing your education, training, um, certificates, all of that good stuff. But then as you start to really think through your last position, I have the same format for I think up to five positions in here. A resume should not just be listing your job duties. Um, that's not how today's modern resume is expected to be, it's not going to help land you an interview. It's important to know what your responsibilities are and how to word those on paper. But where you really stand out is what did you do? What did you accomplish? And so one exercise to do this that's very common in resume writing is using the PAR approach, which is identifying a problem that existed in your job. What action did you take to resolve it? And what were the beneficial results of your action? Let's say you started in a position and it was just taking way too long to get a certain clerical task done. So you identified there was a way to streamline the process and cut the time it took by 50%. That is the perfect example using PAR approach. There was a problem. What did you do about it? And then what was the result? So many people get caught up on, well, I don't have results. I'm not in sales. I don't have numbers. I don't have metrics. I circle back to what made you a good employee? What did you come in and clean up? What fires did you put out? What headaches did you deal with? Essentially, what did you make better by using like your own brain and your own personality? And what did that look like from an action standpoint and what did it lead to? It almost always either in some way leads to saving time, saving costs, saving money. It could lead to increased sales, increased revenue, time on other things. Maybe it improved morale, maybe it decreased complaints. I mean, whatever that looks like, that is the type of stuff you wanna see on a resume rather than just the same old um, reciting a job description. I love to get numbers on resumes and give context to things. So listing numbers of people, like how many you supervise, those are really good ways to do that. And another awesome thing to have on your resume is what type of praise or what type of recognition did you get? Were you one of 
Only two people of 500 that received a certain award. Were you one of the only ones that received a pay increase? Um, were you asked to take on more responsibility? So many times, a lot of the reasons why people are looking to leave a job is they were given a lot more responsibility. Oh, you're doing such a great job. I'm gonna add this to your plate. And maybe they're not getting paid more for those things and you're getting resentful of it. Well, now's the time to get it on your resume. So thinking through what do people bring forward or ask you to take on because you did something really well, that's a great thing to think through and have on your resume. And what I tell people is this guide is just meant to like trigger your brain. So don't worry about wording it perfectly or what it's going to look like. Just think through what that data and what the context looks like for you. If you got awards or special bonuses and then positive feedback, maybe it's coworkers, maybe a vendor or customer said something. These are all really good things to think through. So I recommend um, also making sure you have volume and data into account. So for here, there's some triggers with like revenue, market growth, number of employees trained. Maybe you are the longest person in your department and you've now trained five new people a number on your resume and to sh show to someone how awesome you are at your job. And if you created anything, almost all of us have maybe at some point created a checklist or we put a policy into place. Those are great, great things to have on your resume. As are um, any honors or awards, languages, computer skills, professional groups. If you're looking to pivot careers, I strongly recommend you join the professional group for your area and get on a committee. Anytime people talk to me, how do I get into HR? The first thing I say to them is, well, did you join the Madison Area Society of Human Resources? And if they tell me no, I say, well, you need to join it. You need to get involved and you need to have that on your resume because your competition does. And so the job search process really is a competition. It comes down to who, who networks well, who has really good branding materials, who's prepared for interviews, who's ready to sell themselves. So you can put your head in the sand and say, oh, I don't need to do sales. I'm really good at what I do. Like that stuff doesn't matter. Um, and maybe that will be the case for you, but I would recommend that you take those things into consideration because if they help you land it, then you'll get to where you're going, wanting to go faster. I love to see community involvement if it's relevant um, or within reason. Sometimes I joke with people, if all I see on your resume is community involvement, unless you're just re-entering the workforce, I start to wonder how you actually have time for your job. <laughs> so that's always like a double-edged sword. And then think through what your skills and weaknesses are. Those are just great to note because if you identify maybe some of your weaknesses as certain things, you want to factor those into what your job should look like. So with that, we'll go back to the screen here. And I just would love to see all of you take those into account for all of your jobs. My recommendation is to go back anywhere from 10 to 15 years, but usually beyond that, you want to get creative with how you list those accomplishments, just so you're not facing any age biases. And also, quite frankly, employers just kind of really want to know what you did in your last job or two after that. It's been kind of a little while, so even, those, even though those are really good things to have, it just, um, from a branding perspective, you wanna cut to the chase and focus on what's most important. So some hacks I have for you. Resume Genius is a website. They have templates on there. It's a pretty user-friendly um, resume builder. I think for those of you in a time crunch who just need to really throw something on paper, that can be a good way to get started. Word has some built-in templates. I've also purchased ones on Etsy. Um, I've used Canva. It really just depends on what your job search goals are and what type of industry you're going into. Most of the bigger companies and even a lot of the small and medium-sized ones will use an applicant tracking system. That's just essentially the database that they're using to post jobs and collect resumes. And if you're doing a lot of job searching or studying these topics, you'll start to hear a lot about the applicant tracking system score. And so I just recommend taking a look at a website like skillsinker.com. What this site does is it essentially lets you copy and paste the job ad or job description against your resume, and it will give you a score. 
and that's um, score, typically applicant tracking systems will assign a score. So let's say you want to apply to Target. They're a huge company, they get tons and tons of resumes. They may set a minimum score where if their resumes for, let's say, an accounting role don't meet at least 80% of the threshold of what they're looking for in terms of the job and experience, they just don't want to waste their time looking at them. That um, will allow the recruiter to just narrow it down to the ones that are more focused for what they're looking for. That's what that score means. So oftentimes the robot or the system will have a score attached to it for really large volume positions. And it narrows down the window in terms of who the good applicants are very quickly based on those keywords. Because let's just say you had an accounting role and you were looking for a VP of finance. Well, if you got 5,000 resumes, you don't have time to look at all of those resumes. Nobody does. There just would not be time. Let's say it's like a Fortune 25 company and let's just play pretend with the numbers. If we only want to see candidates that have certain financial experience, certain tasks, certain certifications, maybe a CPA is an absolute requirement, that system can weed out automatically anyone who didn't have it listed. So if you go through an exercise like SkillSinker, you can find out the keywords that their materials are branded more to what they're looking for. And typically it's very easy. You can swap out some words. A lot of times I recommend clients have a few different resumes just because they may be applying to jobs that are similar but could be very different. So those are some faster tips and tricks for how to beat the keyword score, but also how to make it a little more bearable as you're applying. Um, in today's applying, typically at least for corporate positions or anything kind of more in a medium or larger business size setting, or really even in the one-on-one -on -one roles, having a strong LinkedIn profile, a really, really solid cover letter, and being strong at networking will be so key. I have some cover letter cheat sheets I want to bring up real quick, so I'm going to bring those up. Um, my pet peeve with most cover letters that I see are that they essentially just recite what the resume says, and they're so boring and they don't have a lot of good formatting and they just say the same thing that every other cover letter says. And so what I tell people and tell my clients or anyone that asks me for advice is your cover letter needs to sell the employer on what you will do or help them with. So for instance, this first example is using a networking contact. If you have a networking contact or you somehow have an in at that company, it better be on your cover letter. Um, you need to list their name, their department, their title, especially if it's a really, really strong lead at that company that can give you a really good like in that's huge. You need to use it to your advantage. And so this goes through, it's, it's just not about you. It's really about them. You want to look through their job ad and figure out the key two or three areas that they're looking for and sell them on how you can do it. This is an area where I love to add in quotes from performance reviews, maybe add in um, a copy or a section of a LinkedIn recommendation. Prove and sell yourself, not just through what you say you can do, but through validation of others. That's really awesome to do on a cover letter, and that will help you stand out compared to others. And so obviously at the end, asking for the interview is huge. Another one, this was one I threw together on Canva. This one too really talks about how you can help them. There's not the networking contact, so you leave that part out. But you'll see that 80% of the cover letter should really revolve around their job ad, which shouldn't have really anything to do with what's listed on your resume. You could point out you know, things they're looking for and how you've been really good at it in the past, but you want to focus more on how you can help with that than just reciting your resume. There is a really great networking book called The Proximity Principle by Ken Coleman, and he has a free podcast. It's the first go-to I suggest for people who just don't know how to network, and I really recommend they start there. A lot of times when people struggle with that one, what I am finding is that they still don't know what they want to do. 
So if you listen to that book or read it or his podcast and you still don't know what your dream job goals are, you may find his book harder to um, picture putting into practice. But if you've really, really identified what your dream job is and what that looks like for you, if you apply the networking concepts in Ken's book, um, it, it just so works. It's how I've helped build my business. It's how my clients right now are still landing jobs. It's how some of them were able to land jobs even back in March when all of this first hit. And so I just can't emphasize enough how important networking is. I really do think it's like a 50-50. Um, you need to spend 50% of your time actually applying to jobs, making sure you're going through that process, but you need to spend the other 50% of the time networking. Sometimes um, I have contacts that go either way. They either spend all of their time networking, but they're not actually applying to anything. And you need to be in their systems. You need to be an applicant tracking system. You need to go through the process of filling out all the annoying forms and things like that. So it's key to still do that. Even if you're networking your way into a position, you still need to play by their rules because they have their own employment laws or own internal compliance features that they need to make sure that they're doing. So it's key to still do that piece. However, you really need to do that hand in hand with networking. And it's a little more challenging right now with COVID, but there's no reason you can't do a phone call, you can't do a Zoom session, you could drop. I've done walking networking sessions. I mean, it really just depends on where you're located and what people's comfort levels are, but there's nothing stopping anyone from doing an informational interview via Zoom or the phone right now. So I just can't emphasize the networking and how critical that is and really utilizing LinkedIn to help you. And then another um, podcaster and career coach that I really like is Jenna Viviano. She has a really, really good free LinkedIn guide. So if you don't have a LinkedIn profile yet, or if you know yours needs some work, I think her guide does a really good job of laying it out for you. And I think it's meant to like help you crank it out in an hour. And so I think that's another good one I really like to recommend. Um, so I just like to remind people, you know, aim high. You won't know until you try. It's so important to go after your goals and people can sell themselves short. Back when I worked in HR, I could have the same exact ad, but if it had a more complicated title, I would get 95% less responses. And it always blew my mind because I thought, you know, people wanted to aim higher. They wanted to earn more and it could have the exact same thing. And they would apply to the more vague, generic kind of title that frankly sold them shorter than the more complicated or challenging title did. So it doesn't hurt to try. It really is on the employers then to do their research and process to make sure you're the right fit. It cannot hurt to put your name in there and to at least apply. And that just, there's so many times I hear people tell me, well, but you know, I don't have that one thing they're looking for. Try. Um, you just don't know until that happens. So my job search checklist has some really good tools at the end for questions or things to ask them so that you can think about how to interview them because really you wanna make sure it's a good fit for all parties. And so feel free to follow me on Facebook and LinkedIn. I share tons of free content and tips. And we, I am also excited to announce we're going to have a free job search support group launching at the Oregon Public Library starting in November. They should have some details out on their website pretty shortly. I'll be facilitating it. We're starting it once a month. If we have um, good interest, we may do more than that. And it will be available on Zoom um, for the time being if anyone's not based in the Dane County area. And so as I had mentioned um, at the beginning, I wanted to make sure we save some time for questions. So I'm gonna exit out of here and pull it back up so Andy can help moderate and I can answer any questions. Thank you so, so much for your time today. Thank you, Nikki. It's always great hearing you uh, uh, go through this presentation. I've seen it a couple of times now and I feel like I always get uh, you know one or two uh, nuggets out of it. Um, yeah, we did. We did get a handful of, uh, of questions here. Um, first one, uh, more of a comment, I guess, coming from Hannah. Never thought of a SWAT for finding my dream job. Should be interesting to try. Thank you, Nikki. Um, that is a, a good tool to use. Um, so my tip there and why I threw that in is 
think through now um, the mental aspect. It can be really draining when you're not hearing right away or you know what some of your hurdles are. So I like people to really think through that and think what to do about it because it can help your confidence a lot. So good luck with that one. Next one uh, comes from Nancy. So stating that her biggest challenge is that she didn't know what she wanted to do, but now I know um, that she wants to, she wants, she knows that she wants to change careers. Um, I'd also like to ask about suggestions for effectively networking online. Any tips for uh, effectively networking online, Nikki? I like to do one-on-one -on -one things. Um, I would utilize LinkedIn as best you can and request if you could do some one-on-one, -on -one, like let's say there's a recruiter at a company you really like or someone in that role. If you do more of the like larger things where there's a lot of people present, maybe get the name of one or two you liked and follow up afterwards with one-on-one. -on -one. I've just found that to be a lot more effective. Um, here's the networking example I did. I threw something out in like a women's entrepreneur Facebook group I'm in and just asked if anyone would be willing to network. It led to, I think, eight meetings. And of those two actually led to either a referral or the opportunity to do something. And so it's kind of a numbers game. You're going to have to put yourself out there because some people are just not going to have time for it or they're not interested. So I would just keep trying. And as you have the right Zoom or phone sessions, um, it really does help. I think Zoom can be a great way because at least you have a little interaction. And otherwise, a quick phone call is always good as well. So I would target LinkedIn and see who you want to chat with and start there. And then what I recommend is ask them for who else they would recommend. Like, okay, you know, this is a really great thing do you have anyone else you recommend I could talk to and then is networking's a two-way street so a lot of times people are just you know knocking on doors looking for a job it's like if there's a favor you can do for them if there's something they're looking for help on maybe you offer to proofread something drop them off a cup of coffee I like to keep networking to be a very very low cost situation but these folks are busy and if they're taking time out of your day make sure you follow back up and let them know where it led or let them know how you're doing check in and ask how they are um, just whatever way you can do to make it a two-way street maybe they need an introduction to someone I would um, that's my hugest advice there awesome next one comes from Chris many of the companies do online applications they ask for a resume or CV but don't say anything about a cover letter how do you include a cover letter in that case a lot of times you can copy the cover letter onto the first page and then have the resume after. So you could even upload it as one giant PDF. So like indeed, a lot of times if they're not asking for a cover letter and you don't even have the option to submit it, that's how I recommend you do it. It can make their applicant tracking system read it funky. So if it's like parsing everything in in a kind of yucky way, um, you'll have to decide whether or not it's worth to include it. But I would recommend it. Um, oftentimes you can just copy and paste and merge all of those documents into one. And you could even consider doing the references at the end as well. If clients have like really heavy hitting um, references, I like to get those on there. Awesome. Uh, this next one comes from Nancy. What do you do about references when you've been out of the workforce for several years? That's a great one um, and it can be hard. Usually there has been volunteer experience. Let's say you were the class mom. Let's say you helped you know, organize a fundraiser at your church. Um, whatever you did to help somebody somewhere, even if you didn't get money for it, as long as they're not a family member, they qualify. Churches and um, nonprofits and places you volunteered are huge ones. If you don't have any of those either, then I would see what you could do to start getting those or talk to friends, neighbors, and other folks that you're not related to, to see. I mean, maybe you did an awesome job every year doing the Christmas party for your husband's work. Maybe one of them will talk to how detail-oriented and organized you are, but just think through things like that. And then if you still don't have any, then I probably recommend finding some. What can you get involved with in terms of a committee or just like a quick one-off project so someone can speak to it. And then a really good place to start is do some temp work. Maybe you pick up like a couple days of a temp job just so, you know, someone can say, oh, she was friendly. She did a good job. She rolled up her sleeves. That's a really easy way to get one pretty quickly. 
Next one comes from Chris. Uh, how can we access your job search checklist or smart checklist? And I think, I don't know if you have a link that you can just share with me and Nikki and I can copy it in there or what, what the best way to go about that. Yeah, might that's a good one. I think LinkedIn won't let me put it on there. It's on there right now as a PDF and my website won't either. So maybe what I can do is send an attachment to you, Andy, and you can send out all of this after this call to the emails yeah. if possible. I'll send all of it because I think it's helpful. Perfect. Awesome. So yeah, so that looks like that was the last of the questions. I want to thank uh, you, Nikki, again, for putting together this presentation. Like I said earlier, it's always great getting to, to run through it um, more than once. Uh, thank you all for tuning in over the lunch hour. Um, I will do my best to go ahead and get all of that information out to the folks who uh, I have their email for. So if you tuning in here on uh, Facebook, um, please go ahead and, and go register on the, the Eventbrite page just to make sure that I have that email address to share out with you. Uh, with that being said, I'll go ahead and cap it there and we will see you folks next time. Thank you so much.